Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're uh, going to get kicked off with the next in our series of webinars. We've been hosting these uh, every third Thursday of the month, and we're excited to be meeting with you here um, here in March. Uh, we know that you've got a, a probably your choice of things to be watching this afternoon, so appreciate that you're um, maybe taking a moment away from basketball to join us for our uh, Octave webinar today. Uh, to get started, just with a few introductions and the agenda, my name is Kelsey Adams. I'm an engagement manager here at Octave, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Um, like I mentioned, this is uh, one in a series of webinars that we're hosting for our customers once a month with a purpose to really introduce to you some new features that you should know about. Our product team is always innovating and uh, we've picked out seven things that we want to make sure that you know about that have recently become available that we'll be sharing with you today. And then we're also going to go through a few best practices of the month. And this month, none of those are brand new things. Um, we might say actually that some of them are maybe underappreciated but can, can give you a lot of uh, bang for your buck when you know how to use them correctly. So we're going to cover a few best practices of the month and just follow, um, end with a couple reminders about what's coming next and a date for our next webinar. So thanks again for joining us. Just a few housekeeping things before we dive in. Um, you can use the chat window that will appear on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate with us if you have any questions for us throughout this webinar. We'll try to take a chance to um, take a moment to answer those questions as we're going through this. Want to make sure that the content that we're sharing with you is really relevant. So if you've got any questions or uh, comments as we're moving through it, feel free to ask it and it might be relevant for us uh, to share with the rest of the group as well. So let's go ahead and dive right in. <coughs> the first section we're going to cover is on new features that you should know about. Like I said, we've got seven of those this month that we want to highlight that have all become available since the last webinar that we hosted in February. So here's an overview of each of them, and we're going to dive in um, with some screenshots uh, and graphics of each of them, uh, and I'll display them or go through them in just a little bit more detail. So the first is that we've moved our message center into our user menu. So here's a screenshot for you. You can see in um, the top of right hand corner of my screen, my user icon has a little orange dot next to it. And that's indicating for me that I actually have a message in the uh, Active system, in the message center. So when I click on my user uh, menu here in the top corner of my screen, I'll see that I have one message waiting for me in the message center. So just calling this uh, subtle update out, the message center previously lived on the left-hand side of that user, um, user menu icon. Uh, so we've moved that within our user menu, and you can see that a, a message uh, is waiting for you by that orange dot next to your icon. <clears throat> Next, just want to call attention to our expandable document title in the table of contents. So when you're looking at your table of contents, which is going to show up on that left-hand side of your document, you'll see that for long titles, uh, which would be the, an example I have here on the left, that um, not all of that title um, naturally fits into that first line. So we've got through this orange carrot icon the ability to expand that long title. So here's just an example of what that looks like. And again, we're seeing that at the top of our table of contents. The next update is the ability to specify when a page of your Octave document should only show up in the offline output. So think a PDF document. We call this print only because it only shows up on that offline version, the printable version of the document. And this is different from what you could consider our first output of a document, sort of a web only output where we're uh, showing you that online version of a document. So we have realized that there might be some situations where um, you've created a piece of content that should only show up in this document if it's taken offline as a PDF. And we've, we've had the ability to do this through some source code that you could edit to determine where that content uh, shows up. And now we've made that easier to do 
with the ability to make a page, uh, specify that that page will be print only. So we've got just the three steps to complete that here on my screen. First, we're clicking on that gear icon in our table of contents, just right next to the page we're interested in. And when we click to edit our properties, we're going to check that box that says print only. So that's the new thing that you'll notice in the account. Page properties now has the ability to be print only. And when we click save on that, we'll now have the ability to see a little printer icon next to that page in our table of contents. When we hover over that, we see that this is a print only page of content. So uh, ultimately when your client, your prospect uh, receives this document, they won't see that page showing in the web or online version of the document. Uh, they'd only see that when they take it offline in what we're calling print only here. The next item I'm going to talk about is our uh, few updates that have been made to reporting. Uh, the first one here is that our users report now has the ability to filter by work group. And so we, you can see here that we've selected our reporting tab. We're looking at our users report in this case. And here's this new work groups filter that will allow us to select a certain work group and um, display users in that work group. So I should mention that um, this will come in handy for those of our clients who are using this work group enterprise level feature. Um, that, that have that configured in their accounts and that they'd be able to see this uh, filter work group uh, it's showing up in their reports tab now, um, helping to improve that reporting experience. And the second update to our reports is that we now have the ability to control some of the columns that will appear in that report. So we realize that maybe not all of these columns are valuable for uh, each user who's coming in to view this report. So you see this all columns button, I've got a little graphic here for you, is where you can control the pieces of information that are going to populate in this report. Uh, this report can also come offline as a CSV file if you use that download button. In this example, it's that green download button on the right hand side of the screen. <clears throat> Our next update here are really some great improvements to the um, People tab, uh, managing the recipients of your document. So what we're talking about here is within our document, in the People tab, we have the ability to add people who are going to be associated with our document. And in this specific situation, um, I'm using a document where um, I'm going to be capturing maybe multiple signers through a DocuSign workflow. And the new thing that you'll notice what's just been released, is that we can hover over that recipient's digital business card that I'm showing you on the screen here where I can see some information about the people that have been related to this document. When I hover over that gear icon in the top right corner, I have the ability to either edit or delete this recipient. So if I click that edit option, the people modal is going to pop up for me and I actually have the ability now to edit the information for this record. Uh, maybe update an email address. Uh, in this case, we're using DocuSign, and so maybe here I'm changing um, the ability for who the signer will be or even the order that they will sign. So that's the ability to edit right from within a contact that's already been edit, added to the document. So a ton of huge value there. The second option that we have is uh, when we click on this gear icon is to delete this recipient. And when we click to delete that recipient, it's going to remove them from our People tab. Um, if that person's already opened the document and viewed that document, you could think of this as a soft delete. So we're going to keep hold of all the tracking information um, for, for knowing where they've spent their time in the document, what pages they've looked at. And you'll still see them show up on the People tab um, as a deleted recipient, a deleted person, and you'd be able to hover over the gear icon there and actually restore them for this document as well. So again, this is our um, new capabilities, new functionality all around the People tab and adding recipients to documents, and then giving you the ability now to be able to edit who those people are, maybe remove them from a document, um, maybe restore them to a document, 
um, all with some easier to use um, uh, functionality. And the last new feature that we have available that I'd like to highlight is the new ability to grant account login access for specific users in your account. So for those of you on the line who are administrators who have maybe been working with our support team in the past, you're probably pretty familiar um, with the fact that uh, each of your accounts has an active support user uh, in the account. And this is just a free and required user that our team, specifically the support team, uses when troubleshooting in your account is necessary. And so that user will still have access to be able to help you when necessary when you write in with, um, with support needs through our portal. But what we're able to do here is actually allow a specific user in your account to grant access to our support team so that they can come in and have a, a first person point of view for that user's experience or the problem that they're experiencing. So the place that this can be accessed is actually on the user profile for any user in the system. And we've opened up here the tab in the user profile that now says grant account login access. So this is new as of uh, just about this week would be the first time you'd be able to notice this. And if you've been working with our support team this week, you may have um, noticed that they've asked you to come in and grant access. In this image, the very bottom line is where we'd be able to actually grant the access, and that would be in a quantity of one day, three days, uh, a week, or a month. So that would give Octave support team access to the account for that specified duration. Great. Uh, this one, so that, that does it for features, and I'm just uh, looking through our list here to see if we have any open questions. Um, if not, uh, feel free to submit them to us, and we'll be um, trying to answer those through, you, through the chat window for you live as they come in, uh, and we'll take a moment at the end to answer uh, live questions for everybody as well. So I'll go ahead and jump now into the best practices portion of the webinar. We've gotten through the features we wanted to share this month, so this section is on a few best practices. And like I mentioned earlier, none of these are brand new features, um, but can be really powerful in your account. So I want to take the chance to explain how they work and show you a few of these things in action. So the three best practices we're going to talk about this month are about referenced content, versions, and uh, applying page breaks to documents. Um, and so that's specifically going to be a PDF output question. So for this, I'm going to come online. And the first piece we're going to be talking about is our referenced content. So referenced content can be content that exists in your asset library as a master copy and is referenced in other places in your account. And to just show you that in action, I've opened up a template, my sales template, and I'm looking right now at my terms and conditions page. And I can see at the top of this page, I actually have a gold bar across the top. It has a little lock icon, and it's letting me know that reference pages can only be edited from the content in assets. So if I actually try to click into this page, my editor is not appearing for me. I can't make any changes to this page of content within this template. And that's because it's, it's been linked to that master copy that lives in my asset library. So I can click on that yellow uh, golden bar at the top and it'll take me to that page of content. And what can be really powerful um, about referenced content is it becomes a way to keep a single page of content up to date when it might be used in multiple different templates in your account. And what I mean by this is, let me open up a second template. So maybe here is my upsell template. Uh, today I've just got an order form in it, but I need my terms and conditions to appear in this document as well. So what I'm able to do is add a new page from my asset library. And when I select that page, I'm going to choose to add this page as reference. And when I do that, it'll be the same experience uh, as the other template I was looking at. So my template here now has added that page. We've got my golden header at the top letting me know this is a reference page. I'm not able to make any changes here, but I've got the terms and conditions page that I've created one time 
now mentioned or used in two of my templates, in my upsell template here and also in my sales template. So how easy is it now for me to come into that master page in my template library and make some changes to the terms and conditions? So by updating this one page of referenced content, I can come back into the two templates where it's being used, and I'm just going to do a quick refresh, and see that those changes are actually flowing through into my template. So I update my terms and conditions in one place, and now we see that flowing through into every document where that terms and conditions page is being used. So there's my uh, small edit showing up in both of those templates for me. I'm going to move now to my asset library to show you that that's where, my, uh, that's where that page, that terms and conditions page lives. And if I uh, take a look, I'm actually seeing a link icon next to the title of that content page. That identifies to me that this is used um, as reference content in my account. And when I select that page, I get some more information that shows up on the right-hand side of my page for me. And I can actually see where this page is referenced in templates. So I can see it's showing up in my sales template and my upsell template. So again, the, the real benefit here is that we're maintaining one copy of the terms and conditions in our asset library. And we're seeing it, we would see any of those updates update in any template that is using that page as a reference. So some other places where this could be really beneficial might be in an About Us page that you'd like to use in all seven versions of your templates that you have. Uh, we just had a question come through about some settings uh, for, our, um, for our content pages. And the, um, I think the question that we had asked, I'm just going to open up this content page again to show you, uh, is that this content page, just like every other page of content, would have the ability for us to set some permissions uh, and decisions about the page. So for example, we could disable editing for this content page and prevent it from being edited when it is included in a document. So just like other content pages in the account, um, these reference content pages can also have some decisions made about how that they'll be able to be accessed and used in the account. And there, again, since it's just a normal Octave content page, uh, there's nothing that says we, um, uh, we could certainly add things like uh, an asset, like images um, to these pieces of content um, and, and style them normally just using the Octave editor as normal. The next, um, so just to, to do a quick summary, that is reference content that we just talked about. And um, we've seen that at play in our templates. You can identify a reference page of content by clicking on that page and seeing the golden reference page um, icon across the top of that page. You can add a page as referenced by inserting a new page from assets. And when you select that page, clicking this little checkbox to add the page as reference. And then from your asset library, you'll be able to tell what pages are um, referenced by looking for the little link icon in front of the name. Here's that link. And when you select that page uh, on the right-hand side, we'll be able to see uh, that this document is, excuse me, this page is referenced in two of our templates. The next best practice that we wanted to talk about this afternoon is about using versions. So I'm going to open up an example of a document that I've created here. Uh, it's a sales document that I'm crafting for Jane. And my versions tab exists for me on the right-hand side of the page. And what versions allow me to do is take a snapshot of my document at a certain moment in time so that I can go back to that moment in time and look at that snapshot at a uh, in the future. So the way that versions work, I'm going to open up this um, list here of all the versions I've created of this document. We have a naming convention that will name the version zero point number 
uh, up until the point that it is published. And then once it's published, it'll be a, a numerical number such as one, two, three. So you can see I had three versions before I published, point one, point two, point three. And I've created two versions so far since I published. And we're now on a current version here. And what versions allows me to do is, uh, like I mentioned, take a snapshot of a certain moment in time and um, go back maybe and, and take a look at that and even compare it to a, ne a, a next version. So here I've turned on to look at version one, uh, point one, excuse me, my very first version of this document. And I'm gonna compare that to uh, the, the next version that I made. And what I'm able to do is see that additions to this document will show up for me in green. Uh, anything that I removed will show in a strike, uh, striped red line. And I can now go through and compare this uh, version to the next version to see what might have changed. So comparing is one benefit of versions, just being able to track some of the things that have moved or changed from version to version. I'm going to go ahead and stop comparing and come back to my current version. Versions is also the way that once a document is published, we can open up the document for editing again. So once a document is published, that's what really allows us to lock it down and be able to externally share it with a prospect. So that publish step is really key. And being able to make a new version of that document lets me edit this current version, excuse me, this current document uh, without needing to make a duplicate copy or start over again. So I'm just gonna click this create new version button. And we'll notice now that when I come into my document, my editor will appear for me. So I'm able to um, edit this document as I normally would. The editor is working exactly as I'm used to it when I normally edit. And I can make any changes to the document that I need to. So while I'm in this edit mode, I can edit things in my properties, such as a client name, or the value of a document. These, these uh, fields have opened up for me to be edited again. I can add and remove sections or pages. Um, I can uh, go about um, adding additional content to the document, um, styling it in any way that I need to. And when I'm finished, all that I need to do is come back and click the Finalize New Version button. And like I've showed you before, we'll actually now see that there's a new version here. So that, that saved as version three. I'm now in a current version. And we'd be able to go back and compare any of these versions to each other. But what's super beneficial for your customers at this point is that all through the online link that you've already provided them to this document, they'll be able to come back in to that document the very next time they open it and see the most recent version of the document. Um, I should point out that in this case, I'm showing you our proposal document type. So this is versioning with proposals. And um, again, I've accessed that on the right-hand side of my screen through the versions tab. And we can control looking at various versions through the drop-down list in the top corner. And we can create a new version using my create new version button and finalize a new version or cancel out of that version uh, right here in the versions tab as well. I'm gonna take just a moment to pause just to check and see if we have any questions on this topic that I can help with. All right, doesn't look like any new ones on versions. Um, so versions can be really powerful in terms of um, creating one document for one client, making any updates to that document by making new versions, um, being able to track some of the things that have changed along the creation of that document, uh, maybe come back and compare version to version what's changed. Um, and again, we wanna call this out as a best practice um, in terms of document management and knowing how to edit a document um, before it's published as well as after it's published. And we've, we've actually got people singing versions praises right here in our comments. Somebody loves versions. We're excited to hear that, actually. Uh, it's been around for probably over a year at this point, uh, maybe more than that, and um, actually has been providing huge value to our customers and, and ultimately we hope the end users. Um, previously, before versions, 
the workflow really required you to make a duplicate copy of a document so that you could start editing again. So um, just the capability to, to maintain things all within one document um, we hope is bringing in a lot of value to you and we, we enjoy hearing that, that people love it. The last piece we want to call out as best practices today, and this um, we're mentioning because um, in our January session, for those of you who joined us, we spent a little bit of time talking about um, how to style a document for PDF output. And there's a lot you can do with the Octave Theme Builder to control what that PDF output is going to look like. And I'll just bring this back up on my screen for those of you who joined. Here's um, a, a look at what we styled together in that webinar. Um, we uh, talked about building a cover page and choosing placement of text and color of text to build that cover page uh, and style a table of contents at the beginning of a document. Uh, we talked about what the background of that PDF is going to look like. Here you can see I have an example um, letterhead that's the background. We talked about the concepts that some things might only show in an offline version of the document. And so here's just a really quick example of how we're actually including an online link to the proposal in the PDF output as a best practice so that if, uh, even if your document does come offline as a PDF, that we're allowing your prospect the option to come back online. There's a, a lot of tracking uh, information that's only available when that prospect is interacting with an online document. So in this example, we're just giving them a link so that they can come back online and view that document with us there. One other thing that we're calling out today uh, as a best practice is the ability to add page breaks to a document. So a page break is going to determine where Octave, when styling your PDF, ends one page and begins the next. So where we truly break our text and then um, start the next page on the very following page. And this is a best practice because um, when you're thinking about allowing your prospect to take a document offline, um, it often can pay off to set up some things maybe on your template that's being used over and over again that are going to make that a good experience. So you can see in my document here that at the bottom of this page I have a double dotted line across the page and what this is showing me is uh, this is the um, icon for a page break. And you can see that when I turn on my preview for the document that that goes away, that, that double dotted line actually won't be a part of my document uh, when I send it to a prospect. But that double dotted line does indicate that when Octave gets to this line, it's going to start the next page on the very following PDF page. And we'd recommend as a best practice that adding a page break to the bottom of a table of contents would be a best practice to help conclude the thought for this page in your table of contents. So then we move on uh, next to our About Us section, About Us page, and we can again add a page break at the bottom of that page. Now this best practice that I'm offering can be beneficial for you no matter how, really, how long this content page is. Because we're building online documents, this page that I'm looking at here, this About Us page, is not confined to the normal constraints of an 8.5 by 11 page. In fact, this page could be uh, as long as I'd like it to. And the best practice of adding that page break at the bottom of the page just means that when I get to the bottom of this page, the bottom of this thought, my next, um, sequentially, the next page of my document will start itself on the very next page. So here's a few other examples of that, just adding that page break at the very bottom of the page. So that after I finish this thought, however uh, long or short that, that might be on the PDF page, I'll start my next page uh, on that very next page. And we can see that playing out uh, here. So here's my pricing. I don't have pricing in this document, but we had a page break. So after that pricing information would print, we'd see my terms and conditions starting on the very next page. So how to add a page break. When you're in your editor, you can place your cursor where you'd like that page break to live. And we're going to come up to insert and page break. And that's just going to add those double dotted lines for us. Now I should tell you that anywhere that you add that page break, and, and you truly can add it anywhere, 
Octave is going to follow those same rules I just described. So we'll, anytime we come upon those double dotted lines, we're going to start that content on the very next page. So in this example, we'd have Dear Jane, thank you on one page. We'd start the next paragraph on the very following page. So really, I, I've offered the best practice of adding a page break to the bottom of every page. I think that um, is, is a best practice that is pretty sustainable for almost every document people are creating. But you can add these page breaks anywhere you'd like in the document in order to get the PDF output that you'd like. Great. So that's page breaks. Again, beneficial when we're styling our document for PDF output um, and allowing our prospects to take those documents offline. Since we're talking about taking documents offline, uh, I'll just point out to you that that's possible using the download document button that shows up at my bottom of the table of contents. And I can control that in my properties tab by turning on or off the ability for a PDF download. So turning that on or off actually is going to take that button away. Um, so for cases where you're really interested in keeping your prospect online for all the tracking benefits that come with that, turning that PDF download button off uh, is perfectly acceptable and it actually means that um, some of the styling for PDF output aspects that we're talking about today um, maybe wouldn't be necessary for you. So again, that's in the document options area of our properties tab. So those are the, the pieces of the demo that I, um, that I wanted to show you live today. We've got just a couple more thoughts as we're wrapping up and then we'll have some time for questions. So feel free to send those in if you haven't already submitted them. And what I want to remind you is that our support portal can be accessed at octave.com support. And under the yellow section, that's where you can find trainings, uh, videos, recordings, web, webcasts, podcasts. Um, and so our webinars will be listed there, our tips and tricks webinars that have um, the past few months that have been hosted. You can get to links to view those there, as well as podcasts. Um, the first episode is available called Octave Notes. It's on uploading an image. So you can find all of that in our support center under the yellow uh, heading, training videos, webinars, and podcasts. So you can expect uh, from joining today that you'll receive a link to the video. So those of you that maybe have a little split screen basketball uh, going on and uh, need to catch up on some of this uh, or want to refer back to it, you'll be able to receive that in an email, the recording, and then can access it here on our support portal as well. And then we'll just close up with letting you know some things that are next that you can be looking forward to. We'll be continuing this webinar series on the third Thursday of the month. So the next one will be in April on the 20th. And then in May, we have our spring release planned for Monday, May 15th. Uh, and you can look for some more information coming about a pre-release webinar to share with you uh, in advance of that what's coming. And we'll do a follow-up training webinar as well for you uh, after that release happens. So dates still to be determined on that, um, but we'll be sharing that information as soon as it becomes available. And then finally, we uh, want to make sure that the content that we're providing is relevant for people that are coming to listen. So please give us your feedback. Uh, as soon as we wrap up this webinar, there'll be a, a place for you to submit some information, um, just a real quick entry box where you can give us your thoughts on today's content or things you'd like to see next month. Um, so please give us that. Uh, it helps us make sure that we're providing things that are relevant for uh, the people that are coming to listen. And with that, it looks like we've got just a couple questions. So let's take a look here and see if we can uh, answer any of these. Yeah, let's answer this first one here. So this is about um, something that we uh, mentioned a little bit today but didn't dive too deep into. And the question is about um, why, why would I want to add people to my document in the People tab and send them their specific URL versus sending them the public URL that's available in the Properties tab? And what we're talking about there is really the difference in um, in tracking that's available and in the recipient experience. So I'll, I'll talk about those two different links separately. So the first link uh, that is available in our properties tab, we call that a public link. 
And that's because anybody who receives that link is going to be asked to enter in a first name and a last name in order to view that document. And uh, we'll receive some tracking information based on that. We'll, we'll know who viewed it based on first name and last name. Um, in some of our workflows, this would allow people to sign the document. And in some of our workflows, that public link actually will not allow a signer to, to sign. So we, if you have specific questions about your workflow, um, we'll probably want to connect and answer those offline. But that's the recipient experience for the public URL, is that they'd be asked to enter a first name and last name. The second URL that we're talking about, you'd find when you go to our People tab, and you enter someone in with a first name, last name, email address, and you even have the option to email them out of the Octave system. And when that happens, we create a unique URL for that specific person. And the URL is a bit longer than the public URL. And anytime someone clicks that unique URL, we already know their first and last name. So we log them directly into the document. Uh, when they have that URL, their experience would take them directly into the document to begin viewing. In some of our workflows, that specific URL is required for people to sign the document when we need to know exactly who the signer is going to be. So that would allow them to get to uh, a document that has an accept button or a button that's going to allow them to sign. Um, so really the, the two differences there are the, the experience for your recipient in terms of being automatically logged in or being asked to enter in a first and last name. Um, and then probably on the tracking end, um, if that public URL is shared, we know exactly who those first and, first and last name of the people who viewed that document in addition to maybe your intended recipient, we would know exactly who they are. We also have a question here. Um, looks like we're asking if we um, would like a page or a piece of content to not print in the PDF. Uh, if that's something that we would still have to edit in the source code. And that really fits nicely uh, in with the comment that I made earlier about preparing an entire page to only print in that PDF. Um, and I've actually got an example of this uh, from our last webinar that I can show you right now just to um, explain the question here. Um, there is definitely still a possibility to use our source code to uh, tell Octave when something should only show up online and maybe not be a part of that PDF. And a video is a good example of that. Um, so to answer this question in short, yes, you would still need to use the source code for this type of, um, this type of feature. But we, we'd be able to go into our source code for the document. And what we're looking at here is um, it's really the opposite of print only, telling us not to print this in the PDF. So maybe in a situation where a, a video is obviously not going to be able to play in a PDF, uh, in this case, we've said, you know what, in that case, just show my video online. And if somebody downloads this document into a PDF, I want you to actually print out a little uh, language that says, please view this proposal online to watch the video demonstration. So it's the same concept here. We're controlling the view for online with a video and the view for offline with some text asking them to come back online and view that document. I think that does it for um, most of the questions that we've received today. If we didn't get to your question, uh, we'll be following up with uh, each of you um, with your account manager on some of the specifics there. Thanks again so much for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Um, please stick around for just a moment and give us your feedback in the survey that we'll be posting in just a moment. Thanks so much.